All right. This is Dan Middleton, and you've joined another exciting edition of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. All are welcome at this meeting and, of course, at our other technical working group meetings. Uh, likewise, everybody's welcome to uh, communicate and contribute on our mail lists and chat server. And um, last but not least, of course, contributing code under an Apache 2 license to any of our projects and labs. If you're not familiar with how to uh, interact in any of these settings, we do have a code of conduct available, which I will briefly summarize as saying, please be respectful of everybody else in the community. Uh, we've got mostly new business to discuss today. Uh, just to tie things in with, with last week, uh, I wanna thank Todd again for sending out minutes as usual. We had some good discussion on that thread. Thanks to the presenters from last week. We heard Dave uh, heard from Dave Checky on a supply chain proposal submitted by uh, several uh, Hyperledger contributors, including myself. There was good feedback on that, and I anticipate revisions back out to the TSC ahead of uh, next week's meeting or the one following, depending on some travel schedules for some of us. Uh, we heard from Victor on the Caliper project, uh, fixing some issues that are endemic to an incubated project. So good work from Victor on uh, helping to uh, shore up some things that, that were going on there. Uh, Chris updated us on the Fabric project. Congrats again on the 1.3. Uh, that project has a uh, very healthy release cadence and that's a, it's a nice accomplishment to see that so, uh, so regular. Uh, also raised issues with chat and JIRA, which I think you'll see the dialogue on the mailing list there. And then finally, we heard from Andy Gunderson on the Sawtooth project. Uh, heard about the upcoming 1.1 release and uh, some issues were raised on CI, which have also been uh, addressed or are in progress of being addressed rather uh, over email and chat and so forth. Uh, moving into today's agenda, we've got the usual event reminders. Uh, Todd, I don't know if you've got updates on any of those. No, no updates. Still targeting March 4th. We're talking with a couple um, organizations in Hong Kong and beyond that can potentially host uh, Hackfest. Um, so that would be more budget friendly. Um, trying to close on that. And then, yeah, Global Forum going to be an exciting event. Um, so definitely participate in that. It's for the entire ecosystem. Okay, great. Uh, we've got a few updates today. Um, first up will be Iroha, and then we also have a late breaking update from the technical working group, China. Uh, do we have a presenter on from Iroha? Yes, I'm here. I'm Ken Salahi from Soranitsu Labs. Hi. All right, well, I will uh, turn the dialogue over to you. Okay, shall I start now or where it goes? Yeah, if you like, I think I can uh, copy the uh, update link into the TSC channel in chat for you so people can follow along or you're also welcome to share your screen if you prefer to, if you prefer to do that. Oh, yeah. So, How can I share the screen? Share. Uh, you should see a share button in the the bottom of the Zoom. Yeah, I see, but it says uh, you cannot start screen share while other participants sharing. Ah, so you you're supposed to stop sharing, I think. Yeah, right. All right, can you see it now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, so, hello everyone. Um, I am from Ceramitsu, one of the developers of uh, Hyperledger Iroha, and this is our uh, next update. Uh, see, I think the last one was in July, and since that moment, we released uh, Beta 4 version, which happened on 2nd of August, and we are now working hard towards uh, beta 5 release 
which is uh, going to be shipped, I think, next week, if everything will be fine. So the project health is good. Uh, we have uh, now community manager who helps us a lot with uh, managing questions and different bugs and the features re requests from the community side. Um, we launched a new channel in Telegram uh, about news in Iroha. We're also very active in Rocket Chat and existing Telegram and Gitter uh, messengers. Yeah, so community was very active as, as well. Uh, it, uh, we have constant uh, community members who tell us about the problems, uh, the features that they like to see in Iroha. Uh, they also tell us about some bugs and uh, for example, some of them really made us to postpone our upcoming release. Um, yeah, we are now working towards make, uh, making more community events. Like we recently, we had an event about our consensus algorithm in Iroha. And in future, I think we'll have more of these kind of things uh, like presentations or webinars from uh, Iroha side discussing new features and maybe some problems uh, with community. Um, on December, we plan to ship um, Iroha 1.0 release and uh, we already finalized all the features that we want to include to our final release in December. And uh, it will have a network testing framework uh, in order to help uh, developers to test uh, uh, interaction between Iroha nodes inside the network. Um, we're also working towards substituting our current ordering service, service to the new one, which is gonna be Byzantine Fault Tolerant. Uh, it's uh, already implemented in the developer branch and uh, Hopefully it will be shipped uh, in beta 5, but it might be postponed and released in 1.0. We also improving our documentation of uh, YAC consensus algorithm. We also have a white paper about consensus algorithm. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we need to uh, improve our peer initialization strategy of the network. Um, so the strategy, how do we add new peers? How do we remove them and so on? Also, we want to uh, improve our log verbosity um, to have more debug messages uh, that help us to reproduce bugs from community. Uh, we soon will have uh, replay attacks uh, solution for queries and transactions in Roja. We consider including uh, like mechanism like session keys and uh, uh, transaction caching, uh, which will help us to prevent replays in future. Yeah, and also uh, we need to process reject cases in the YAC consensus. And um, uh, we also want to add uh, Iroha Online Sandbox in order to make it easier to play with Iroha in future. And also uh, we want to have load testing for uh, performance regressions uh, using Hyperledger Hyperledger, of course. Uh, since last uh, report, we have new Iroha maintainer, uh, Mikhail Bodorov, who is from Russia. Uh, yeah, on the lower organizations, uh, uh, our contributors did not change. Uh, it remains the same. Um, yeah, we have uh, several active community members from uh, Ukraine, Taiwan, who ask questions and uh, uh, prepare issues in GitHub. Any issue, any question, um, usually answered within a few hours. As you probably noticed in, if you follow our chats in uh, Telegram, Rocket Chat. 
yeah. So, and our current plans are actually to stabilize platform and prepare it to release in December. Um, yeah, we also want to improve process within the community. As I said, we want to have more webinars, presentations, and so on to be more interactive with community in future. Um, we also want to increase diversity of maintainers to invite uh, more maintainers from all around the globe. And uh, uh, we also need to move from our own Ceramitus Jira to Hyperledger's Jira to um, make it easier for community to follow any issues and features that are currently under development. Yeah. I think this is basically all from my side. Yeah, if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Thanks. Thanks, that was a very thorough update. Uh, floor is open now for questions and comments. Um, in the project updates, they talk a lot about the new contributors being added. Are you seeing kind of a regular churn of contributors or are you seeing kind of a steady growth? And can you comment at all about kind of the, the company composition of contributors or, or kind of the, the magnitude of, of how much you help you have or what kind of help you need? Uh, well, uh, if we're talking about contributors, majority part of them are hired by the Ceramitsu company and their employees of Ceramitsu. Uh, even though we have fewer members um, outside of the company who also make prepares uh, pull requests into Iroha, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, we need uh, more contributors in future. And uh, uh, for now, we're looking for them uh, from our company side not from outside, I mean, yeah. So that, that is of course a, a key thing to work on, especially hearing about uh, the, the plans to get to a 1.0. Uh, a lot of the projects, I think we'd all, well actually we'd, we would like all the projects to have a diverse contributor base when they're going to be announcing a production release. Part mm -hmm. of the stability of, of the project is knowing that that a single company's departure isn't going to invalidate the project as a whole. Um, I was taking a look at our Hyperledger community calendar. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's a listing of all of the meetings across the community. We've had a lot of discussion recently about actually reducing the number of meetings that projects and working groups do because it, it can, uh, it can work against global diversity, time zone diversity for contributors. But I'd say in Iroha's case, uh, unless I'm missing something, I don't, I don't see any meetings on there at all. I wonder if that might be another uh, opportunity for you to help recruit more interest or ramp new interest into your project. Yeah, right. As I noticed, uh, we want to conduct more different kind of events. Uh, um, and uh, notice, notify community about that as soon as possible. Yeah. So, for example, if we have, if we have to discuss a new feature and we have several options, uh, and uh, we want to know what actually our community wants to uh, to be implemented in Iroha, we can conduct a webinar or a presentation to discuss this kind of things. I think that might help. Yeah, I think something that's been useful in some of the projects, and at least in Sawtooth, we have an application developer forum. So people who want to develop on top of Iroha could come to a meeting like that. And that's a way to help ramp those first initial contributions where somebody can then grow into a, a maintainer position from there. I think another thing um, you mentioned, you use like three different IRC um applications and, and so that can also be limiting to some people to have to try to track that many yeah different what could you repeat please sorry the irc you said you use rocket chat telegram and yeah. something else and gitter 
Yeah. So that, you know, for me personally, that would be something that would limit me coming in because now I have to monitor three different things. So. But. Oh, no, it's not a problem. We have a bridge, for example, between you know, Telegram and Rocket Chat. So every man message is being uh, uh, sent from uh, Rocket Chat to Telegram directly. So everyone gets noticed about that. Okay. So it's a feature. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, we had a little bit of discussion in Montreal with some of the Iroha contributors about getting exclusively onto Rocket Chat and not using uh, bots to interact with Rocket Chat. It's a way to get more mm -hmm. integrated with the Hyperledger community. Yeah, well, we know that. Um, yeah, now actually, uh, most of the developers are moved to Rocket Chat, and uh, we try really make them uh, use this thing instead of Telegram. And in future, we will only, I think, uh, interact with the community there. But for now, we have a lot of members in Telegram, and we have to support that as well. OK. Uh, if there is additional feedback, feel free to take that to the mail list. And I think next up is probably Bawa. Uh, are you giving the, the uh, Technical Working Group China update? Oh, Dan G will give the presentation. He's also the co-chair of the TWC. Hi. I'm sorry, your Jay. audio is broken up. Could you repeat that? Hey, Dan, sure. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jay Guo from TWC, he will give the presentation because he is also a co-chair. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for being available, Jay. Yeah, Jay, go ahead. All right, can you see my screen here? Hello? Yep. Yes, we can. All right. Uh, hi, this is Jay from, from China. Uh, I'm the, one of the newly elected uh, board member of uh, Working Group China. Uh, so I'm gonna, so as always, uh, TWC is working on four areas, uh, development and innovation, Internet, uh, internationalization and education, uh, collaboration and scenarios, and then uh, event organizations. So I would say in last quarter, most of them are going well. Uh, so overall activity in last quarter will be, um, uh, we still held uh, regular bi-weekly meetings and uh, we got uh, more than 20 attendees on average per meeting and uh, uh, we, very often chat in WeChat groups. So we have channel in Rocket Chat, but in China, people, most people use WeChat group and we have quite a lot of them. And uh, the conversation there are going, I would say very, uh, traffic is high basically. And in August, we elected two new board members, uh, me included. Another one is Zhen Hua from, uh, from IBM China. So we have three in total. Uh, Bao Hua is still the chair. And uh, we, uh, we, we've we done translation of Fabric 1.2 uh, from all the volunteers from China. Um, a lot of them are from universities in China, actually. And uh, the inter internationalization team is mo moving forward to uh, Fabric 1.3. And uh, we continue to organize meetups in China so we had 12 meetups across six cities in last quarter. So this year we've held uh, more than 30 meetups across 10 cities. And uh, we've, we've got uh, from 40 to 200 attendees per meetup, depending on the space capacity and the popularity of the blockchain technology in the city. So I'd say uh, this is quite active and we got a lot of interest for every meetups and we got we in this way we accumulate a lot of volunteers and some of them became the speaker of the subsequential sub uh, meetups actually and we uh TWGC keeps helping developers in china to contribute um, and uh, a small group of developers have been working on the uh the code 
to uh, comply with China encryption regulation. So in China, we, we use different al uh, like crypto algorithms and uh, this is like regulated by the government and some products released need to be complying with those regulations. So we have a group of people working on that and they are reaching out to CryptoLib team to see how this can be integrated into Fabric and potentially other projects in Hyperledger. And we have active developers in, uh, in Cello and also uh, like Fabric SDKs. And uh, last week, I think another uh, group of developers uh, contributed Blockly. That's a project uh, using a, um, uh, doing graphic smart contract development. So it's based on a framework open sourced by Google. And in TWGC, we've reviewed the project in, uh, for two weeks, and I think a lot more people are getting interested. And we have uh, several volunteers discussing to launch a testnet in China and uh, potentially connecting individual peers and uh, donated by individuals and uh, blockchain as a service uh, provider and uh, potentially also some uh, Kubernetes clusters. And this has been kind of going, uh, like ramping up and uh, a lot more people are interested. We have a WeChat group of 100 people and people are also like already talking about the architecture and uh, the, uh, the resource they could get. So any resource from Linux, Linux Foundation is also highly appreciated. I think this is in line with the testnet proposed in the global community as well. Uh, we do have several issues uh, here. So first of all is uh, one of the four areas a working group is working on is collaboration scenarios. Basically we collect use cases from all the companies and try to share them in the, in the group. But we've got less momentum in this area uh, companies and organizations are not that motivated to, to share or promote their use cases. We, we are still trying to figure out the reason behind that. And the second issue is uh, we have, uh, there's a lack of talent, especially for projects other than Fabric in China. Uh, I think where they are, I mean, Cello is probably fine, but there are definitely a few of field developers for, for, for example, Sawtooth or Eroha in China. And so there's only one talk about Sawtooth this year during the meetup series. So I think this is definitely, there's a definitely space for this to improve. And uh, we've been encouraging uh, developers to contribute uh, to all, all the projects in Hyperledger. But uh, probably there's a, either a language barrier or there's a culture difference, but uh, it's it's a bit hard. Like we don't see many new contributors from China, and uh, uh, they are not that active as we expected. And the third one, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the this uh, China encryption regulation work has been done since the last year, but it's a bit hard to get integrated into Fabric. Uh, I think due to technical issues and also due to various reasons that probably people don't know how to compute to open source or people don't have just, there's no, not much time for them to work on this, but they are currently uh, working with crypto lib teams. I think this is probably going well, at least going better. And the fourth issue is that we, um, we kind of need some funding from Lynx Foundation to maintain the meetup because uh, I mean, uh, we've been trying to use some free space like provided by universities. And uh, we also have some free offering for live webcasting. But uh, from time to time, there's a money issue and try we're trying to maintain the neutral neutrality of the working group. So either uh, it won't be hijacked by any sponsors or they there's a space for anybody to participate or to present their ideas. So I mean, it'd be highly appreciated if there are some funding uh, that can cover space fee and uh, other materials like some posters would be nice. And the planned work product will still be a uh, technical event, uh, documentation, mostly translation and uh, 
education materials. And uh, we definitely want to see more code contribution. I mean, not only from the uh, project or uh, components mentioned before, before mentioned, but also some new areas. And the participant diversity, I think it's pretty good. Uh, so geographically, we have, we've covered most uh, major cities in China. And uh, from uh, big companies uh, to startups, we all we have many different uh, volunteers and participants in the working group. And uh, we've been engaging with universities, like uh, Peking University uh, has been providing uh, the meetup space since the beginning of this year. And we also have Fudai Universities in Shanghai providing the space. And also a group of students from another uh, Wuhan University is helping with uh, translation. So I think diversity is pretty good. Uh, I don't have any additional information. Uh, any questions? Thanks for the update, Jay. Uh, questions and comments from the TSC or the community? <clears throat> well, I think, yeah, again, thanks, Jay. I, this is Chris. I, um, I think the, the one thing that I, you know, that comes to mind is this whole notion of a test net. And I know we teed that up for discussion towards the end, but I, I'm still struggling with the whole notion of a test net. Um, and um, so maybe we can just have that there. But um, I know you said, well, we need, you know, we need to, to do more of this, but I'd like to better understand what people think they want to get out of it. Um. So, uh, so when uh, those volunteers propose it, the idea is quite simple. I think first one is dog fooding. So they, they've been working on their own use cases and they want to see a public space that they can experiment and they can put some probably not very useful but interesting DApp out there. And the second is we want to have a, um, a application that can motivate more contributors, for example, it's not necessarily a token, but it could be a credit that we give to uh, volunteers as a proof of contribution. And uh, it may not be used to buy anything, but it's a, uh, a record that this people or this individual from any company, they've contributed either code or a translation. So the idea I think is quite simple and we don't expect a very scale a network, but just something that people can use as an example and they probably can play with. So, so I, I don't think this could be a very like a, a big uh, like like a hundred nodes of net network that people are very excited about, but I think we start like take baby steps and start with something small. So there's there's a lot, but there's a lot in there, right? So then there's there's you know sort of the contribution and gamifying things a little bit. We talked a little bit about that at the member summit, um, and uh, the Hackfest in in Montreal. Um, both, you know, I, I I do think that, you know, trying to, you know, as part of the whole you know grow the community kind of a thing that um, we should be you know who's you know, presenting at meetups, who's contributing code, who's helping to translate, who's, um, you know, doing, you know, writing apps and so forth, and who's going out and doing training. All those things, I think, are, I think that's worthwhile pursuing. I'm not sure that a test net necessarily addresses that per se. Um, although, again, we could, I suppose, have some token tracking thingy. I don't know, that would be interesting to see. Um, but that, that's not really a test net, that would be just like an application. Um, the, you know, where, you know, deploying something where people can try out their, their new stuff. And, you know, again, I think, I don't, I don't understand why Helm charts are not enough and then people can get their own coup um, however they want to source it, but that's just me. Okay, um, yeah. any other topics for, for Jay? Um, yeah, that was, um, <laughs> that was really interesting, Jay, thanks. Um, thinking about the, the issues you raised with, like, I guess a hypothesis that language barrier is, is something that gets in the way of cross-project um, uh, collaboration. Uh, do you think there could be a role for maybe like an extension of the technical ambassadors that we have that 
could specifically maybe across multiple projects uh, try and farm out tasks and, and, and help with communication. Um, uh, do you think there's people that might be up for taking those kind of roles? Well, I think Linux Foundation is trying to recruit a technical ambassador in China. I don't think there is a result yet, but I do think it would be very helpful. I don't think that the, uh, as far as your sort of a related thing on, on funding the meetups, I don't think that Hyperledger ever funds meetups directly. I do know that there's things like stickers and stuff that can be provided and that um, we can use uh, Zoom meetings that are provided through Hyperledger for, uh, for uh, uh, these kinds of meetings that we're doing now. But I don't think we typically have funds that can cover space rental. No, we, we definitely prefer not to per, um, do space rental, um, but we have provided, some, um, especially for first or second time meetups in a city, um, money for food. Um, but uh, I, yeah, the, the space typically you, you can find you can find spaces for you know to 100 people at universities and 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 other companies in the area. So we do try to connect organizations we know of in any given city um, to each other um, and, and try to rotate around, you know, hosting these things. But, but yeah, generally meetups, you shouldn't have to pay for space. One other thought that comes to mind for you is in, in order to get other project participation, uh, you might try to recruit from the maintainers of the other projects to come and present. I know your meetings are, are typically in, in Mandarin and, and the maintainers from other projects might not be able to um, speak that. Uh, but if there's, um, you know, th think about whether uh, English or, or Russian or whatever the particular maintainer's language is, whether that presentation would still be meaningful if you could get those maintainers in, it might stimulate some more interest. Yeah, sure. I mean, just if there are any maintainers out there who want to promote the project in China, just reach out to me or Baohua, anyone in the working group. We definitely want to help. And we have meetups across multiple cities. So, I mean, anywhere you go, I mean, any major cities you go, we can figure something out. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that update, Jay. And again, uh, further dialogue you can take to uh, chat or the mail list. And uh, Hart Montgomery, you are up now. And uh, Hart's going to be talking about a uh, project proposal for a shared crypto library. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, so I will post the uh, project proposal in the chat. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, so this is something that I guess we've been talking about for quite some time now. Um, so I think many people here are already familiar with it. Uh, but the general idea is that we want to build a project-wide shared crypto library uh, so that all of the other projects can use it. Um, we think there are a lot of good reasons for doing this. Uh, they're listed in the document. Uh, basically, it saves effort. We avoid duplication. Uh, it potentially improves security. Uh, it allows us to concentrate our resources. Uh, we have a finite number of crypto and security people. Uh, having them all concentrated in one spot is probably a good thing for the project and for security. Uh, we think this is potentially the first step towards having, you know, sort of a highly modular code base. Uh, and we think this will also help with uh, interoperability. So I don't want to spend too much time talking uh, because, well, most of what I would say is already in the proposal anyway. And I think many people are already familiar with this. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, to really just open the floor for questions, if there are any. Oh, well, I'm sure there are, but All right, I'll be the first one. Um, what is the commitment from the projects to do actually incorporate the library into the projects when it's available? None. I mean, it's totally opt-in. Uh, I believe I say that uh, somewhere in the document. Um, it is on page, uh, well, Google Docs isn't showing pages right now. Um, it, it, 
it's in the solution. My question is actually for, right, but my question is actually for the Satya Thoreau, uh, uh, Indy and other developers, right? Is, is anybody committed to actually using this when it's available? Yes, um, from the Indy side, we are, are planning on using it as soon as we can. We're in the middle of graduation from incubation processes. And so one of the questions we have for the TSC is, um, we would like to encourage the use of this project, um, but, and we're curious as to whether that causes any complications if we push hard to move to you know, making our releases depend on this package as soon as we feel like it, it meets the same stability requirement that we've had in the code that we have moved over into this project. I, I don't see how that could read negatively on um, exiting incubation. So what about Tatu? Dan, are, uh, you guys, are you all committed? I know you guys are contributing actively to the project right now. Are you, are you planning on making the move? Yeah, so what we've done so far is worked together with uh, the other contributors on, on the project there to align on a signing interface. And the, I'd say that we have interest in adopting this library. Uh, it's not necessarily a commitment because we want to see how it, it shapes up. But being actively involved in the development of the library the, the risk that we wouldn't be able to adopt it. <coughs> I'm planning to um, <coughs> uh, use it uh, to rewrite our uh, key signing daemon that is, is part of Borough. Um, I can't really see a reason why I wouldn't. Uh, I'm sure it will work out well and it will be better audited than what we've got. So, so we'd like to use it. Could anybody from Fabric comment? Or uh, Roja for that matter? Well, of course, sorry, I was on mute. <clears throat> um, I guess the answer would be, I don't know. I mean, it, <clears throat> there would have to be Go bindings developed um, and then we'd have to take a look at, um, you know, what what the effort is involved in in, in in making that transition. I suspect it would be a post 2.0 kind of a thing if, at, at earliest. Yeah, we too don't know what to do now. Maybe consider to use that in future. Okay, uh, other questions, comments on the proposal? I'll say that uh, we would expect to have a Go wrapper. Um, so, so that's probably not a big issue. Um, I don't know how compatible the fabric interfaces would be uh, with what we're planning. Um, I know that Sean and Mike have done a lot of work you know, kind of hashing out the, the signing interfaces um, to, to move towards something that both Indy and Sawtooth can use. Uh, but really we expect, you know, we don't expect a lot of the, well, Indy wants to, seems to want to use this immediately, but we don't expect a lot of the, the projects to, to immediately, you know, jump on board but there will be some point at which a feature that projects want to use, say like, you know, uh, some application requires a NIST curve and the projects want to implement a NIST curve. At some point, you know, with something like this, we expect that it will be easier to, uh, to change interfaces slightly to use the crypto lib than to, you know, build some huge new chunk of crypto. Um, Hi, and this is Leonard, Leonard Dedwin. I would think in the interest of interop interoperability, <laughs> it's a long word on the first day, interoperability and standardization, I think all the projects should uh, sort of show support for that level, you might say, of advancement and standardization in terms of 
The new protocols, new standards have been vetted, tested, approved for use by all the tools and platforms. So could be the next major release. I think each project as they approach that major release should give consideration, strong consideration to adapt and adopting the new standard in terms of the shared library. Thanks. Um, I should also mention that uh, most people have been focusing on the, the shared signature part of the library, uh, or sorry, the modular signature, rather than the zero knowledge or, or ZMix part of the library. And uh, I believe that uh, at least some people who are working on Fabric have planned to incorporate that part. So even if the, this, the base signature library is not uh, immediately planned for Fabric use, uh, some of the zero knowledge stuff uh, might be incorporated in Fabric before that. I assume people have had an opportunity to read the uh, proposal since um, Hart sent it out about a week ago. Uh, but if you haven't, we could also draw your attention to the somewhat unique governance structure within that. I don't know if there's any clarifying questions that are required from, uh, from any of the community on that. Yeah, the TLDR is basically that we're going to have, you know, extra oversight of this project. So in addition to regular maintainers, we'll have, uh, people with cryptography and security backgrounds kind of around to, to look over everything and make sure that nothing insecure gets introduced into the project. So, so how is that different than having maintainers? Help me understand. Um, <clears throat> so the, the main point is that we want, uh, We're going to have uh, essentially sub projects. So right now we have a base crypto library and a ZMix, and these are kind of uh, essentially their own things. They're they're two separate hyperledger labs at this point, and uh, and well, there is some overlap on the maintainer list, but it is uh, um, you know it, it's different, and there are different maintainers for for each sort of sub project. The, um, what, what I called the stewards in the proposal, which are the essentially the cryptographers and security people whose job it is to, to go over stuff and, uh, and review stuff are going to be sort of global. And I guess the, the most fundamental answer to your question, Chris, is that um, we need a lot of, uh, well, we want to have some some sort of algorithmic and uh, and cryptographic overview, uh, and it's not clear that you know the people that can analyze the crypto algorithms are necessarily the best coders. Um, so, so we wanted to to sort of codify that role. Did that answer your question? Hey. Could you repeat that? I didn't hear it breaking up. Yeah, Dave, you're breaking up. Can't hear you. But hard to answer your question, uh, sort of, I guess. Um, I, Can you hear me? No. <laughs> I want to try Still this. breaking. Yeah. Dave. All right, I guess, I guess, you know, the, the, the I, I, I think I understand. I mean, you know, we have a similar problem, you know, in fabric and I'm sure in Sawtooth has similar kind of things where, you know, there's people with expertise on cryptography and there's people with expertise on databases and there's people with expertise on distributed computing and messaging and, and then they're just coders. Right. And, you know, nobody has all of it. Right. And, um, and so you do need to sort of focus, you know, certain attention on certain parts, but, you know, I think you could probably do that with having some sort of, uh, I, 
I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about how exactly you go about, you know, do, does every patch have to have sign off from some security guru? That wasn't clear. So in practice, I don't know that we're treating this that formally, if that's your concern. Um, no, I, I'm trying to understand how, how yeah, it out. that's all. The idea here is that there's more than one category of maintainer and you really want kind of a plus one for both categories. Or also that, you know, if, if one category of maintainer wants to do something, meaning that the, just the coders want to do something and the cryptographers say it's not safe, you know, that this governance structure or the calling this out in the document this way makes sure that um, doing things correctly from a cryptographic perspective is the argument that would win. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So I've been dropping on and off the conversation, so forgive me if this sounds like it's you know, off topic or misdirected a little bit, but there was a couple comments that I wanted to jump in on um, addressing Chris's concerns about like, why, why isn't this just the maintainer's job? And, and the reason is, is that, um, well, the number one reason, and, and part of the reason that Hart and I really started thinking along these lines, and I think Nathan originally as well, um, was that using crypto libraries is a huge foot gun. People get it wrong all the time. And one of the neat things about making a Rust layer between the underlying crypto libraries and our main projects is that we can take care of all of those foot guns, make sure that the memory is allocated correctly and that it's, you know, initialized with random data or zeros or whatever all the, the requirements are for getting the crypto protocols correct. And so by having this cryptographic library, uh, we can pull all the talent from all of the teams in one place, we can get it right once instead of having to go out and look at all of the implementations, you know, all the glue layer. I mean, the underlying crypto libraries are, are you should be using ones that have, you know, a, a, a long, long track record of being um, secure and, and uh, you know, well-defined, but how you use them can be, can defeat all of the, the effort that's been put into the library itself. And we've already seen this year several um, bugs against our blockchains that were based around misuse of the underlying crypto libraries. So from my perspective, this increases the security of all our projects um, by making sure that the, the glue library we provide covers all of those potential pitfalls, or at least makes an effort to do that. And then if all of our blockchains code to the API, then they gain from that effort. And we only have to do it once instead of you know, over and over and over again. Um, and it kind of puts a nice interface for us to be much more conservative around using cryptography um, while we are also experimenting with zero knowledge proofs, right? And also trying all kinds of new stuff and consensus. So we can continue, you know, being very fast and breaking things, you know, or not breaking things, but like, you know, experimenting in the blockchain space, but we're much more conservative, at least in the interfacing to underlying crypto libraries. So this makes a huge improvement in the things that keep me up at night and uh, I would love to see this um, be widely adopted and and the last thing about fabric adopting it the commitment I understand that there isn't a lot um, that the fabric team can say at the moment but uh, we have been able to get open source repos for the Chinese uh, government approved cryptography and we have tentative agreements from the Chinese community to help get that into the crypto library and to also um, help with writing and upstreaming patches to make fabric use the crypto library so i mean from a diversity standpoint and in, in that maintainership of that project it's, it's looking good um, we can also then um, you know leverage their their interests to, to um, drive the adoption for fabric that doesn't mean fabric will have to use crypt chinese cryptographic uh, algorithms just means that it's coded to the library and you can then use the the algorithm agility that's part of the library's feature set to pick the right algorithms for your application so anyway i'm done hopefully i don't drop off here okay thanks dave hey chris i originally had some i don't know confusion or discomfort also with the the with the the stewards versus maintainers thing um and Hart in part convinced me that it's useful to have people that can do review, particularly when we're 
considering a new algorithm that isn't uh, standardized. So maybe less about looking at the patches that come in and more about if somebody's proposing to use an algorithm that might not be academically vetted. Um, another thing that, that brought me around to it was that I think it's okay to do maybe a little experimentation in the governance structure, especially for an incubated project. And we can find out if, uh, if having this type of, of governance or, or maintainerish role is, is useful. Yeah, I would say the big question is not around, you know, things that are well established, like basic signatures, but things on the more, uh, more advanced side. So things like zero knowledge primitives, uh, post quantum stuff, uh, non standard hash functions, uh, this kind of thing, like we just had a discussion. Well, there's a discussion on the list right now about uh, a new implementation of a hash function, for instance. So, right, but you, so, so I, I, look, I, I think I get it. I, I, um, I guess there's, there's two, two pieces to this that, I mean, look, I, I think it makes sense to put additional scrutiny and so forth, um, especially on a project such as this. Um, but you can do that in a couple of different ways. Um, <clears throat> You know, having two tiers is fine, but then you also need two tiers of, okay, so how do you get to be a security maven, guru, steward, person, right? How does that, you know, uh, what are the criteria to be a maintainer, right? What's the distinction between the two? I think becomes a little bit weird. Um, uh, and you could just sort of, at least from my perspective, you could just have maintainers and everybody sort of knows who the sort of, if you will, the lead maintainers are. And, and when something comes up, they say, hey, you know what, so-and-so should look at this, right? I mean, it, it's, Chris, it, it, all, I'm, all I'm saying is it could be informal as opposed to formal. And when you put something in formal like that, it just, it can tend to sort of make the approachability and accessibility of the project a little bit harder. That's all, that's all I'm saying. So Chris, are you, are you concerned about the, about sort of, calling this a new governance or about the specific details of adding the roles of kind of gatekeeper here? Uh, it's, um, I, I mean, if, if we, if we called the maintainers and just said that there's an additional responsibility for the maintainers in the project, then it's, it's a specific vetting process. Would you be more comfortable with that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, it, it just creates another class, right? And yet, the maintainers are supposed to be the ones that are responsible, right? And and so what we're really saying here is that look, because of the reasons that that Dave, you know, so eloquently cited about, you know, you don't want bad stuff to happen, and so therefore, you know, when maintainers are reviewing a patch and they're either not fully comfortable that they, you know, and they think that somebody should take another look at it everybody will know who those people are and they will have, you know, the ability to do that. But then you don't, you know, if there's a, a, a small set, I don't know, it was three or four, I can't remember now of these stewards and they're not around and nothing gets landed, you know, then that can hold things up and people can get pissed off and then they just walk away and they leave. And all I'm saying, I'm happy, you know, we, we have that, you know, sort of a little bit in fabric, you know, because, um, you know, they're, they're just a very broad area of capabilities that people have to be able to deal with. And the maintainers just need to sort of figure out how to, how to deal with that, right? So um, all, all I'm saying, I think, is that, well, you could just have maintainers and everybody sort of knows that their responsibility is to make sure and damn sure that, you know, this stuff is good. And so you can do a two plus two and make sure that on, on the patches that seem to warrant additional scrutiny that you, you, you have people go around and, and try and get it, but then the, the, the mundane stuff can just go in, right? You know, I actually agree with Chris on this one. I'm going to jump in on his side on this one. I, I you know, I, I thought that the proposal was fine, but, um, you know, I, I see Chris's point in this and I kind of agree. There's actually two sets of quote unquote expertise uh, in this uh, library project. And one is, you know, 
seasoned cryptographer who's under who understands the underlying mathematics and someone that which is not me but someone like myself who's been chasing zero days for 20 years right who can see the misuse of a library and understand the the requirements of the underlying crypto libraries and make sure that the software engineering is secure and um so i really like this idea of like a two plus two um because it, it kind of forces like someone like myself looking at it and someone like Hart looking at it at the same time, right? And we see it from two different perspectives. Um, I've always thought that if you came into this project and it was a duocracy and you, you know, had the vision of the project in mind and you were constantly doing good things and right things that you could easily become a maintainer. I, I like it to be a little less formal, um, but I always, I thought the stewards thing was a little less formal. Maybe, maybe it's been misunderstood. I don't yeah. Yeah. So this um, perhaps we. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, I was just gonna say perhaps because um, I understand the point about not wanting to frustrate between two groups of people and to, to get code in. Although I would say one of the things with the crypto stuff is sometimes you might think it's mundane and it's not a mundane change. But what if there were separate processes for code entry? as in via maintainers and standard PRs and a kind of rolling cryptographic audit whereby I don't know whether it would make sense to include some sort of boilerplate uh, commentary or something in, in, in a file, but the group of cryptographers, and I don't know quite how you credentialize the cryptographers, but I guess we can figure it out, uh, are going through continuously, not necessarily at the same time as the code uh, coming in, although I realize that then makes it a little bit fragmented potentially, but I guess you could have a kind of an elevation of certain code as it gets audited then some changes accrue over time and then the, the, the audit needs to, to, to be to be redone and those processes could be separate so people don't necessarily get in each other's way okay yeah I, I agree i agree with that statement really because um i guess the maintainers of the shared library will some of them if not all will have uh, cryptographic uh, skill sets as well that would be part of their expertise it may be one or two or several uh, maintainers so using the word maintainers within the shared library so these literally can be called upon to vet and so as long as a product a tool set adopts the shared crypto library then yes, um, these maintainers of the shared library become the people you would call upon or the maintainers you'd call upon to vet and provide oversight of the use of these uh, um, standards and protocols in that library. As long as that shared library becomes part of the, um, <coughs> the, the compiled um, <coughs> implementation. So that's one way of doing it, but they're all maintainers as opposed to separating maintainers with different roles um, within the project. So it's only to provide a, a further level of vetting and um, oversight to ensure that the products on implementation in production um, provide a high level of safety and soundness from a security, um, bug fix, you know, and, um, and all the other areas that we need to be concerned of today. All right, thanks for that uh, last note on that, Leonard. Uh, again, let's take uh, further discussion to chat on the TSC uh, channel in chat.hyperledger.org or to the mail list, and uh, we'll probably pick this up again next week. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye, Bye guys. Yeah, thanks.